What is up, everybody, and welcome back to Tar Heel Illustrated com for another edition of the unc football show i'm jacob turner joining me as he always does very on publisher andrew jones and aj we're here for the the charlotte preview edition of the football show but obviously a lot of things to hit on before we dive into that as carolina finally played a football game every show we've done over the last three four months however long it's been has been without actually being able to see carolina play a football game but we are officially past that with with carolina obviously starting the season with a 19 to 17 win at Minnesota um, last Thursday night. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We've already, you know, ton of coverage from that three things, other videos we've, we've done and, and, and write-ups we've done for that. So we're not going to reanalyze that game, but so much, but I think there are a lot of things we do need to kind of discuss from that game because again, we carry over stuff. Yeah, carry over stuff. We were able to see Carolina finally play a game. Um, but yeah, again, Charlotte this Saturday in Chapel Hill season opener in Keenan stadium, not the season opener for the Tarles, but the first game in Keenan stadium this year for Carolina ACC network. That game starts at three 30 PM, but real quickly to head on over to Tarles sign up eight thirty three 33 a month. Great time to do so. Football season in full swing right now. Basketball, not that far away. And as AJ always says, recruiting never stops. It's 365 days a year. So if you want access to that premium content, access to our premium message boards, live game threads. I think we had over, I think I saw over, I think it was over 3K in our in our game thread on the on the website for the for the Minnesota game yeah. in terms of interactions and views and everything like that. So really awesome community. It's fun to get involved over there and, and, and kind of talk to Carolina fans during the game. So again, come come on over and sign up. Link is in the description below but aj real quickly because i haven't we were talking a little bit off camera about the game that was the first time we've really been able to sit down and, and chat uh you know in depth about what your thoughts were about the game um go watch three things again if you haven't already but w- w- just just looking back at the minnesota game you know w- w- just give me a quick kind of summation of how you know what maybe you took away from the game i know you could go a ton of different directions from it with that yeah. but you know w- what did you take away from that game and kind of what were your thoughts leaving minneapolis last week and, and this is to see what carries over and what doesn't carry over. That's mm-hmm. that's what it's not. Hey, let's talk. Let's analyze the Minnesota game. No, 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 this no. This is here, more. No. This is more. And let's let's move that game forward mm-hmm. in relevance. Mm-hmm. And how it might, how how we could connect things moving forward. So, I'm a big believer that you can only take so much away from openers. People way overreact openers all the time, either negatively or positively. Uh, look at how people are suddenly suspect of NC State because they screwed around a little bit with Western Carolina, even though they closed strong. And I'm using them as an example because I think that there's, in the end, they did what they had to do, you move on, and I don't think that affects the Tennessee game for NC State at all. Now, if you lose those games, I do think you can take something from it, but teams generally that figure out way and when you just move on there's a survive and advance mentality there's a human nature about who you're playing mentality and all that now carolina was on the road against a big 10 team a club that they took uh, uh very seriously and respected a big uh, big time and that they battled for four quarters that was an exceptionally physical game and i do think because of that there are some things that we could take out of it and say okay these are things to look for moving forward. Does this carry into the next week? And most of that starts on the defensive side of the ball, Jacob. First of all, I thought Carolina up front handed their responsibilities and defensive line as well or better than any time uh, since Mac came back. I know they had more sacks and more TFLs against South Carolina, but I thought the consistency up front with how the players played, how they played team football up front, like Des Evans constantly occupying blockers so other mm-hmm. guys can make plays. I thought that was at its highest level since Mac returned. I thought the physicality from throughout the defense, when you see Jakeen Harris coming up and making a lot of tackles, and you and I were talking about this before we hit record. Usually when your safety Legion Tackers, you're like, yeah, that's not a great thing. But if you go back and look at how they handled their run fits and how more physical safeties are in this defense than in Chiswick's or, or Bateman's defenses, you'll understand that a little bit more. I, I like the way that they played on defense. I, I thought that in pre-snap, they never once looked confused in pre-snap. Mm-hmm. I thought the communication on defense was really good and is a sign of the depth that they're starting to accumulate on that side of the ball. When Amari Campbell went out and Caleb LaValle came in the game, he was the one calling the defense. He had that big missed tackle, and you know what? Lesson learned. 
It happens. Learn the mm-hmm. lesson. And there's a ton of lessons learned. He missed that tackle. He makes that play. They never have that first scoring drive. And we never talk, we're not talking about a missed field goal at the end. Carolina mm-hmm. wins that thing, you know, w- without having to deal with that circumstance. But he's calling the play. He's calling stuff on defense when he goes in. So we saw more depth. We saw them use more depth. And that's only 55 defensive snaps. Mm-hmm. And they were still committed to playing some guys, some sec- some second teamers. So I thought there was an awful lot to like about the defense, but it has to carry. Yeah. For example, Jacob, I did. I ran a piece and we're, we started a new piece. Uh, we're going to run every week called Leftovers. Mm-hmm. There's some stuff I didn't get because I'm not doing the old five takeaways that we used to do. I'm I'm running more small sidebars, and then we're putting some stuff in the leftovers that may have been in a takeaway. And when you look at the, the leftovers, I went back and looked at the numbers, combined all the numbers from each of max six openers versus the other 60 games. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the six openers, they've been really good defensively in every one of them. Their worst performance was Florida AM, and m and that's because they play a lot of reserves in that game. And they, they weren't super sharp, but they weren't bad. They gave up 24 points and 321 yards or whatever it was, which they'll live with 321 yards every week. Oh, yeah. But then you look at the rest of the 60, other 60 games, there's no connection. Last mm-hmm. year, they were dominant in many respects against South Carolina, but there was no connection. But they also did a lot of rattle or a lot of yards, especially late in that game. So the key here is – can they carry over a lot of those things that we saw, the discipline up front, the gap control, the no issues in pre-snap, the communication was outstanding. If that carries over into Charlotte, they're going to post really good numbers again against Charlotte. That's what you look for. That's mm-hmm. where there's value in the Charlotte game because they haven't carried that stuff over before. Now, the defense was pretty good at times last year until about the midpoint of the season, and they just fell off over a cliff. So we'll see. But I think that's one of the things to look at from that game that I want to see if this club's able to maintain that. If they maintain it and they are the kind of defense we saw the other night, they're going to have a chance to win every game they play yeah. because they're going to keep people out of the end zone a lot. And I think eventually you're going to start seeing this defense make some plays where they flip the field. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen eventually. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll see when that does happen, perhaps. Max Brosmer, the quarterback from – from uh, Minnesota, I thought that he was uh, on pins and needles the whole night, mm-hmm. and Carolina had 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 a lot to do with that. They pressured him a lot. They sacked him five times. They had five three and outs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Minnesota ran four snaps in the fourth qu- in the third quarter. Carolina had twenty nine snaps there four in the third quarter. They completely dominated. Yeah, and that's the other side of it, the offensive side. I thought the offensive line did got better as the game went on, and you got to think about. The fact that four of them had never started before, they were green for the most part. Blasky was older, but played 158 snaps in four years at Georgia and played very, very well. And then they had to deal with the quarterback situation. Yeah. And they, and and Max was getting into a little bit of a groove. They were finding a way a way to use him. They were they churned out a 17 play drive, man. That's mm-hmm. quarterback, that's offensive line, that's running back, that's play calling. That's mm-hmm. really good football. And then they had to deal with the with Max's injury and Connor came in. They basically played safe football under Connor to get to the win. Connor even told us on Tuesday, basically he was a game manager. Just get us to the end of the game, get us in field goal range and Noah Burnett's going to boot that thing through. Yeah. So I like that. Mm-hmm. The Connor you saw the other night is not the Connor you're going to see against Charlotte. They're going to unleash him some against mm-hmm. Charlotte. You're going to start to see what do they think of Connor? Well, we'll be able to tell by the offense that they run because I don't think that they are in any position to be vanilla to save mm-hmm. stuff because they got to find out what this kid can do. Yeah, He doesn't oh, have enough sure. experience for them to be vanilla because he's not going to grow that much being vanilla. They mm-hmm. need to run the offense. They need to run his offense and let him you know, get that machine oiled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think when you look at the schedule, you look at Charlotte coming up and then central and then JMU, I think JMU is the toughest test in that stretch, but I I do think that it is a kind of a more of an ideal situation than you could have when you look at what happened with that quarterback situation, Max Johnson breaking his leg in the third quarter and Connor Harrell having to come in and again, credit to him for getting, for getting, you know, getting Carolina and helping get Carolina over the line. You're not really getting it. Like you said, the game manager part of it definitely played a factor because you're not going to look at his stat sheet from that game and be like, Oh man, he, he tore it up, you know, two for four, 34 yards, um, 
you know, did fumble the ball. Amari and Hampton was massive in that game. But again, I think the the quarterback position is one that I know fans are, are the most concerned about. And I mean, I would assume to an extent the staff probably too, because I don't know how you couldn't be when you, when you look at, I think when you go back to that game and I'm not trying to rehash that game, but so much, but the main concern on social media and the main concern on the message boards during the game was, I'm not sure what we have here with Mac Johnson. I did think he grew into the game a little bit, but I'm not going to sit there and be like, he was absolutely fantastic in that game. Cause it wasn't. Um, but you, you could see him maybe getting a little more comfortable as the game went in. Yeah. And, and again, you can expect a little bit of that in the first game when you got a new guy coming into a new program and a new offense who hasn't played a ton of football over the last couple of years. Let's not forget that injuries have, have plagued him, unfortunately, but he's out of the, he's out of the picture now because he's out for the season. So now all of a sudden it's the Connor Harrell show and Carolina has to deal with that adversity during the game. And again, they end up getting over the line. I know, that field goal goes, you know, a couple of more inches one direction. Maybe we're having a different conversation right now, but that doesn't matter because Carolina found a way to win in a tough place and in a tough game where they had to deal with a lot of adversity. But all the all the focus now, AJ, I think from the fan base perspective is quarterback. What do we have there? It's the most important position on the field. And again, I think when you look at the next three games, you're you're going to be able to learn something about this team. And we were talking a little bit off camera. I think you made a great point of. You know, let's look at the next game real quick with Charlotte. Not the toughest opponent you're going to play all year, but it's about how Carolina wins that game. It's not about if they win the game. They have to win that game. There's no excuses of not winning that one. It's how they win that game. If the offense maybe let's let's say the offense scores 17 you know points in that game, and you know Carolina maybe ends up scoring 34, but the defense has a turnover or a pick six or something yeah. like that. Maybe special teams makes a big play. That can be a, leave a little bit different of a taste in your mouth than if the offense goes out there and has a really productive day against Charlotte. And you say, okay, it's a lesser opponent, but I'm at least seeing some things here from Connor and from the offense. And we're seeing that O-line continue to play well, seeing Amari on Hampton continue to play well. Then I think you can take a little bit more away from that game. But I do think quarterbacks a concern. I think it's the number one concern right now because – the, the fact of the matter is you can look at the Minnesota game and say all you want and analyze it all you want. And people are doing that. And again, you can't take away so much from game one. But the fact of the matter is, is Carolina is down one quarterback. Didn't even he couldn't even make it. You know, unfortunately, couldn't make it through three full quarters. They're down one quarterback, the starter in that game. who played all the snaps before he got hurt. And now you're kind of sitting there like, all right, Connor, it, it, it's your time to shine. And behind that is Jacoby Criswell, who we talked about, wasn't really even in the mix to start during fall camp. So it's a it's and he's a not right now. Yeah, he's not, he's right not now. even ready. He's not even Chip basically said he's not even ready. I mean, he's not 100 yeah. percent there yet. So, so you have to look at that. It, position it's Connor's being, team. You know what I mean? Everybody it's, it's concerned. Mac made very clear. It's Connor. This yeah. is his job. They got to keep him healthy. So. Look, the way I look at it right now, leaving the Minnesota game and heading and moving forward is. Imagine looking out on TV and you're seeing Carolina's offense. And let's say they're over here going that way. Mm. There's going to be, there are question marks over every area where there's a question mark. It's not so much a question mark about the group, but how that group is with everything else. How does this whole thing mix together? Wide receiver. There's a question mark because they weren't used a whole lot. There were too many targets to JJ Jones. The first touch for Nate McCollum, who didn't play a ton, was in the third quarter on a jet sweep. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it took uh, Bryson Nesbitt's first touch was in the third quarter. Like there was a lot that went wrong that a lot of the blame was placed on max, but I think that they were sort of just hodgepodging leaf, trying to figure things out, trying to find some, some measure of comfort. I give Minnesota a lot of credit to that, but that's why this weekend is important because there's a question mark over the offensive line. How are they moving forward? There's a question mark over Amari, and he had 30 carries and five receptions, 35 touches on 64 offensive plays. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's sustainable over the course of the year if you'd like to have Amari and Hampton carrying the ball in Chestnut Hill and against NC State. You've got to find ways to get other people in the game, other touches. You don't want to be overly reliant on him. If he's carrying the ball 25 times against Charlotte, that's a bad sign. A, mm -hmm. it means they didn't put him away. B, it means, man, if you have to ride that horse to beat Charlotte, hmm, what does that portend for the future? Yeah. So there are a lot of things to look for in this game. Other question marks I also think uh, are, are at tight end, the use of tight end. They've got to find ways to get Bryson Nesbitt the ball mm -hmm. in space. I think what you might see with Connor, you're going to see more RPOs. 
you're going to see more short dump stuff, but they've got to find ways to get the ball to guys in space. Mm -hmm. Nesbitt needs to get targeted a lot, even if it's short stuff, just sometimes I know in the eighties, there used to be a lot of offenses that would just run counters and dives and things like that. And they had really fast running backs and you would pound it, pound it, pound it, and boom, they break one. Mm -hmm. And you'd be really good with that because the whole intent was eventually just to break one. And it was the big touchdown run, and then everything else was three and out, essentially. Mm-hmm. There, there was a, there were a lot of offenses like that in the 80s. I'm not saying this team needs to be like that. What I'm saying is dump, 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 and every once in a while, Bryson might get two yards, three yards, two yards. All of a sudden, boom, he gets 18. Boom, 36 into the end zone, that kind of thing. I think that they have the kinds of playmakers that could do things like that. And how that works and with what Connor could do, we don't know. But they've got to get the ball in the hands of other guys. He didn't do that in the first game. This game gives them an opportunity. There's no excuse not to spread it around. So when you go into a game that some people may say, ah, it's Charlotte, ho-hum. No, it's all like you said earlier. How do they do it? Mm-hmm. It's not what the final score is, especially if it's like 42 to seven. How do they get to 42 to seven? Mm-hmm. Does the offense score all 42 points? Do they do it spreading this thing around? Do they do it with Omari and only getting 12 or 14 carries? Cause that's all he needs. And maybe two receptions. Cause you want him to connect with, with, um, with Connor in the passing game a little bit. Cause Omari needs to be a part of the passing game. Does he spread the ball around to different receivers? Does the offensive line own line of scrimmage and have a 17 play drive like they did against Minnesota. That's okay to do that against Charlotte. Mm-hmm. But do they also hit on some more explosives? They need to hit more explosive plays. They're a, this is a really big game because Charlotte's got enough guys on the other on on the other side of the ball that have played some football. It, it, you're not playing an FCS team. You're not playing Wofford. You're playing a team <laughs> from the Conference USA. That, by the way, 22 of the guys on Charlotte's one, two depth chart are transfers from power conference programs. They have three former Tar Heels. In fact, Dante Balfour is one of their best players on defense. He was a Tar Heel. So that, that shows you that they've got some dudes over there. So I'm looking forward just to seeing how Carolina approaches, how they execute the boxes that are checked. And ultimately how does Connor play? Yeah. Is Connor dynamic? Is Connor a game manager? If you have a game manager, who's in super athlete, that's an interesting thing. We don't see a ton, but I, I, I think it's okay if that's the way they go into this because it gives him time to grow. I asked Mac the other day, and I did not mean this. We talked about this earlier. I did not mean it to 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 be negative about the next three opponents or overlook the next three opponents. When I said, does it help that Connor's got three games before ACC play begins? Yeah. Now, the reality is they should win all three games, including JMU. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're fortunate in that the schedule works out that if Connor was going to have three games to break into, this is a pretty good threesome. It's a lot better doing it now than, let's say, uh, at Virginia, at Florida State, and in that stretch, you know, Georgia Tech at home or something like that it's a better stretch for him to break into it. And he kind of dismissed it and saying, we have a standard. It's the next game and all, which is great. I actually think that's a very healthy message that they're sending, but it does help Carolina that Connor's got to face this defense, then centrals and then Madison, which is a kick up. And then you go on to Duke. So he has time for them to figure out who he is and how to best utilize him. But they're not going to waste any snaps. This is not a throwaway game. Central's not a throwaway game. These are opportunities for this team to find out who they are. And until your quarterback really knows who he is and they know who he is, the whole team doesn't really know who they are just yet. All the other pieces can be there. But if you're if you're struggling at quarterback or unsure at quarterback, then you're only going to your ceiling is only so high. Yeah, yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. I think what I'm going to be looking out for starting with Charlotte and moving on you know, over the next few weeks is, is the offense establishing an identity. Who are we? Yeah, exactly. we know we know we can run the ball well. Carolina, Carolina. Now when I say we, I'm saying it, I'm putting myself inside. If I'm a coach, yeah, I got you, Chip Lindsay. I'm not saying we in terms of you know Carolina me being a fan or something. You need to shave your head if you're Chip Lindsay. Yeah, exactly. Shave it off a little bit, and yeah, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think anybody want to see that, but. No, what do we again it comes back to okay what's our identity here we know we can run the ball well we proved that against minnesota we got one of the best running backs preseason all american okay we got some nice guys behind it we got connor harrell now who can use his feet okay i think we can run the ball well 
But again, the passing game, nothing from the Minnesota game. It proved to me, at least, that Carolina is a good team in the passing game. Because even when Max Johnson was in, AJ, let's not rewrite history. 12 and 19, 71 yards. That's, 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 that's four yards, basically, per play in terms of throwing the ball. Carolina, I don't really – there might have been one. And I'm sure there was. I don't remember Carolina even attempting any throws over the middle with a guy that's listed at 6'5". I didn't really see that. I didn't really see Carolina, you know, a couple of balls that were a little bit further down the field. But again, you didn't walk away from that game saying, OK, yeah, yeah, I like what Carolina has in the passing game. No, I think you walk away from that game being like Max Johnson working his way into a groove a little bit. But even when he was in, we didn't really see him, you know, you know dominate yeah. the, the game through the air whatsoever, especially balls down the field, vertical plays. We didn't see any of that, really. Now, you had Connor Harrell, who comes in as a game manager, isn't really asked to do that. So, but again, it, that really doesn't matter to me because we haven't seen it yet. So can Carolina starting with Charlotte start to, because there's weapons there, there's no doubt about it, but can they form some kind of identity of what they can potentially be through the passing game against these opponents? And then when it gets harder in ACC play, can they carry that over and sustain it? But it starts with Charlotte and it starts over these next three games. So I think for me, that's what I'm going to be looking for as well as the O-line, because I really did like a lot of what I saw from the O-line on Thursday night, but like kind of like I look at the O-line kind of like I look at the defense, AJ, it has to be carried on. It can't just be one game. It can't just be the season over. It has to be carried on over these next three games in particular. And then after that, it has to be carried on through ACC play as well. So I do think Carolina has a great position to form an identity as an offense, but it's one of those things that even us sitting here, I don't think after one game, and this is not necessarily surprising when you look at all the new faces on offense and it just being the first game, but I don't even think we can sit here and be like, I don't think this yeah. coaching staff can sit here and be like, well, we know what Carolina has offensively. We know they have a good running back, but besides that, I'm, there's still a no, ton of question marks there in my opinion. You mean there are a lot of weapons. We know that, but yeah. it's like having a really good big man of basketball, but no guard that can get him the ball. Exactly. Yeah. If he's not part of the offense, he's not part of the offense, and that can be an issue. You're not utilizing your greatest uh, attributes if you're not able to connect them. It's the same thing here. Connor has to connect to the tight ends. He has to connect to the wide receivers. And Chip has to figure out a way to make that happen. But it's all dependent on what happens up front. And then Connor, of course, completing the plays. The offensive line is in a great situation right now because I'm not worried about them connecting from this game to the next game. I think they are going to be individual game seasons within each game as they build forward and they are also beneficiaries of the schedule right now where they should be able to play pretty well develop some more confidence and, and go through certain experiences with the kind of communication up front. Austin Blaskin told Blasky told me yesterday that they had really good communication up front, which is impressive with all the newness up there and the lack of experience up there. So they've got to be really good communicating on Saturday against Charlotte uh, for them. It would be useful if Charlotte had a di lot of different looks and different stunts and stuff that Minnesota had so they could communicate a lot of those stunts. I think that would be really valuable. Then it gets central. It's another opportunity to get better at communication and playing together. Then they got Madison. Suddenly they got four games under their belt. And they're, they're not so much green anymore, and they head to Duke. And that's where, in a way, Charlotte sort of connects to Central and JMU here because this is a three-game stretch for this program to figure out who the hell they are on offense under Connor Harrell. Find ways to minimize Connor's hits because you don't want to go to Jacoby because even Chip said Monday he's not 100% ready yet. Mm -hmm. And behind him is Michael Mertinger, the true freshman from Florida. So they've got to keep – everyone says, oh, they got this running quarterback, got to run, run, run. No. You want to limit hits on Connor. You need to run him because that's one of his attributes. But you've got to be fairly conventional moving the ball for, down the field with Connor because you want to minimize the hits. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very interesting to see – what the plan is going into Charlotte, what they take out of that and then apply it to Central. And Central's not a throwaway game. Those FCS games are usually, in my opinion, throwaway games, and certainly when they're at the end of the year, throwaway games. In this case, that's another opportunity for them to figure out who they are and what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. I use the term the other day, wandering through the weeds, just tossing stuff out. No, we don't want this anymore. That's out of the playbook. Hey, mm -hmm. let's try this. Let's put this in the playbook. I think that's what these three games are about. And then against Madison, <clears throat> a lot of what's learned the next two weeks will be tested. 
but it's still a game that North Carolina should handle without too many issues. And then you've got eight straight ACC games. So the schedule works in their favor. The, the, the lab uh, element, the lab experiment element of these next three games, I think works in their favor. And they're going to do it some because they have to. Because mm-hmm. Connor's not the same player Max was. Max won the job in camp, hands down, like I kept saying all along. Uh, we were on it right right away that it was going to be Max. And yeah, yeah. Max, Max gained separation. Mm-hmm. Connor had some issues with interceptions in fall camp. And so you've you, – this this is a huge game on so many levels for whatever this team's going to be in late October. A lot of that process occurs this Saturday against Charlotte, and so much of it is on Connor. And you don't maybe want to put a lot of pressure on a 20-year-old college dude, but he's got a lot of pressure on him. Yeah. It's his time. It's his team. He, they're not going to run a two quarterback system. They're not going. He's not going to have to look over his shoulder for someone to come in the game. Uh, this is his job. This is his team. I think it was uh, Cayman Rucker said yesterday. This is Connor's offense. It's mm-hmm. his. Mm-hmm. Got to put his stamp on it now. And they're going to have to figure out a way for him to put the stamp on it. And to me, that's going to be really, really intriguing. We haven't had that to deal with in some time. Because even in 2018, yeah, yeah. it was largely Nathan Elliott. They tried Chaz. Chaz struggled. He got hurt. He was suspended the first part of the year because of the shoe stuff yeah, that a bunch of players were involved in. <laughs> uh, in 17, it was a hodgepodge. It was, you know, some Nathan and whatnot. It, it was... It, it was a struggle. So since Mitch has been there, um, they had that struggle period, but then they had Sam and Drake, and you yeah. knew what they were. Mm-hmm. So I think it's interesting from a journalistic standpoint and a football uh, and a guy who likes to peel the layers of a football game. I think it's really interesting how they're going to go about these next three weeks because I think they're connected. Mm-hmm. I really do. And I think it's fun. And I think fans should sit back, not be overly critical. Don't be too reactionary to the good or the bad that you see. Let this stuff just sort of play itself out and see what they are at the end of the Madison game, as opposed to where they start the beginning of the Charlotte game. Yeah, completely agree with that. It's just a team that, again, it's like any season. It's it's, it's going to be a work in progress, and it's it's to be determined how good this team can potentially be. But well, how can you sit after game one and be like, oh, this team's going to be really good or oh, this team's going to be really bad? You, you can't look at it like that. You just got to kind of see how it all plays out. And uh, AJ, I think we'd be also, too, I think we'd be hard-pressed not to talk about special teams a little bit because – if there's one criticism, you know, one of the bigger criticisms you can throw at maybe this, you know, Mac Brown 2.0 era, it's been just the inconsistencies and the struggles we've seen um, on special teams throughout it. But man, this season started out about the exact opposite of that with how Carolina performed uh, really across the board, in my opinion, on special teams to start with Noah Burnett four for four from field goals, you know, hundred percent made, made everyone 52 yards was as long, you know, 13 of Carolina's 19 points were attributed to Noah Burnett. Carolina didn't win that game without Noah Burnett hitting field goals. It's as simple as that. I thought he was a, a very big positive for North Carolina. Even and even going back to the to the punting game too. Tom McGinnis, you know, three attempts, 153 yards punting. That's a 51 yard per average. Um, had one of those three inside the 20 as well. 55 being his longest. I think that was a positive to take away. Was I thought he looked good. I think there were question marks coming into it with him, but I thought his, his you know, first punt. Yeah, he did get fortune the roll in his first punt. Yeah. But but you know. the other two are really good, and you're right. Yeah, that was, and I thought the execution of the punts was really good. That was the problem before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the punting is one thing, but the execution of the punts last year, they had two blocked, but God, they had a lot more that were close to being blocked. I thought the execution was a lot better. Mm-hmm. He looked like he's played college football now. Yeah. He didn't always look like that last year. So I I agree with you. I think that that. That, that's definitely something that they could that they were able to leave Minneapolis with and say, okay, mm-hmm. we're in much better shape here than we than we knew we were going. Yeah, in. there should be. I think they should be feeling relatively well about that group. And even going, you know, even let's let's look at you know Minnesota's kick return yards and punt return yards. I know only one punt was returned for for Minnesota, but it was a five yard return, and then even the kick returns only one in that one as well. But it was just fourteen yards. So. I think all across the board, you saw improvement. You didn't see catastrophic plays made on special teams because we've talked about a lot of special teams can win and lose you games. We've seen it throughout the, you know, just if you watch any football, you've seen it. It's not rocket science there, but special teams won Carolina the game with the kicking performance, in my opinion. 
but also it didn't hurt Carolina defensively. It wasn't like Carolina was giving up these catastrophic returns or these catastrophic plays that put Minnesota in good field position. We didn't see that against Minnesota. So I figured I needed to throw that group in here too, because again, for me, that was a big positive that often doesn't get talked about a lot, but I think it's something we have to address because of the struggles that Carolina's had on special teams. You can't see a group start off well in game one and just gloss over it. Again, that's a positive, especially when you look at this team as a whole and say, okay, I like what I saw defensively. I like what I saw on special teams. I'm not sure what they have on offense. You're going to need all three of these groups to perform throughout the season for Carolina to have a good one. So I think you're starting out right now with three groups going in the first game, and I'm walking away feeling pretty good about two of them and maybe TBD about the other one. But that's you know kind of expected when you look at the quarterback situation right now. So special teams, I, I'd give it a big positive coming you know home from Minneapolis. If they're not going to be great or even really good at quarterback, they must be really good in special teams. Yes, they can't yes. find other areas to complicate matters. I think Elijah Huzzy's really good returning punts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know DeAndre Boykins had that penalty, the the block, which was after on decent return. He'll learn from that. I mean, mm-hmm. dude missed all last year. He played 931 snaps two years ago. And now he's a reserve and he's in a different position. And he's on special teams, made a mistake. He'll learn from it. I think they have a chance to be really good in the return game. By the way, Liam Boyd had a bunch of touchbacks. Yes, yes. So mm-hmm. they're back to that. And that's, that's, you know, Max all, Max all about the touchbacks. Don't let them have a return yard. Don't get an opportunity to take him to the house. Make him start at the 25, make him a little bit more predictable. So you're right. There are a lot of things to be, to, for, for Carolina fans, feel pretty good about with the kicking game, you know, special teams. Noah Burnett, by the way, he was 19 of 20 last year. And with four for four the other night, he's now 23 for his last 24 oh, yeah. since the miss against, since the fourth quarter miss against Oregon in the bowl game two years ago. Mm-hmm. And he was six for six between the 40 and 49 last year. He's now eight hit eight in a row between the 40 and 49. So there's a weapon there. He's really good. And mm-hmm. they know that. And that's why I think they should have tried. They should have kicked a field goal on, on the fourth down, fourth and four at the 31, and that first or second possession, whichever one it was, mm-hmm. kick a field goal, take points. You've mm-hmm. got a quarterback out there while you're learning stuff, take points, get confidence. Once you get three on the board, they can't take it off. So take the points. I think he's a weapon. You might see them sometimes play for that. They certainly did the other night with Connor. Oh, absolutely. They played, let's just, let's play safe. Let's get the field goal. Let's boot this thing, get out of here. They must be more aggressive and sort of now moving forward. But the special teams was definitely a good sign. And there was a lot of emphasis put in it. And I do know that they played full speed on some special team stuff in camps. I was watching. I was watching the kickoff team at one of the open practices that we were allowed to see. It wasn't full speed with the return guys, but it was full speed and full contact with everything else. And they did that more this year than they've done in previous years. And it's one game. It's a one snap scenario, but I think we saw a little bit of payoff uh, on on Thursday night, Minneapolis. They need to be clean these next three games too. If Carolina wins big, but special teams has snafus and there's drop passes, there was only one drop by receivers the other night. If they if they do if they're doing things that can beat themselves, even though they're winning these next three games, that's that's that should concern people. And given the uncertainty at quarterback, they just must be as clean as can be, and they must dot at every eye that they have on the team, and that includes special teams because it really is a third of the game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And again, we talked about it so many times. Not, we haven't talked about it for no reason. We've talked about it because we've seen it just hurt Carolina in the past you know, a couple seasons. And again, it, it's always a positive when you look at an offense that's still trying to struggle and find an identity. If you got that kind of, you know, you, you got that safety net a little bit and Noah Burnett to say, hey, go make us a field goal. I mean, that that can really help you out. And I think we'll see a lot of him this year. And I think he'll be relied on heavily this year. For So from a Carolina perspective, you, you hope that, yeah, I think you said 23 or 24 continues because I think they're definitely going to need it. But hey, just move on to the, you know, final portion of this. Let's, let's, let's talk about the preview here. Let's look at Carolina's matchup with Charlotte. Again, 3 30 kickoff ACC network on Saturday in Chapel Hill. I'm going to list, let me list the Carolina connections real quick. Cause it's all over the board, man. Um, 
three players, Dante Balfour, Jaquarius Conley, and uh, wide receiver Justin Olsen. Uh, just from a personal standpoint, I thought it's great to see Conley just, you know, back on a roster and play his college football. Got hurt a couple seasons ago and not on the been team. And, yeah, been through a lot, man. So just, just, yeah, uh, I hope he does well there. Uh, yeah, yeah, me too. He, me too. He's been through a lot. Yeah. He's been and, through a lot. And mm-hmm. I think it's great that, that Dre Bly's there. Mm hmm. And Tim Cross is there. Cross mm-hmm. is such a good guy. Um, Dre, I think, being there, got JQ there, and he's got an opportunity now, uh, far more than football. So oh, yeah. I- I'm really glad to see him there. Dante Balfour is playing really well. Mm-hmm. He's preseason all conference. He was one of the representatives at uh, Conference USA Media Day. Justin Olson met with the media yesterday. Mm hmm. And, you know, Justin, Justin played a lot of snaps. He didn't get targeted a lot, but I remember it was a Notre Dame game. They played up in South Bend, and Justin yeah, played yeah. like 80 snaps that game. Forgot about that. And he, he was a two-star kid back when Rivals did two stars. When he came in, people were like, well, why did they bring him in? He was in Mac's original class. Mac went and nabbed him quickly and got him in that class. And and I think it was important for another in-state kid to say yes to Mac right away. And I, and I think that there was a residual effect of him doing that. And he's in a place where he has a chance to play a lot. So. The other connections are uh, Tim yeah. Brewster, who yeah, was Tim Brewster, yep, mm-hmm. 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 Dre Bly, Tim Cross, well, what, Tim, Tim Brewster what, what, at one time Max, one of Max's buddies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, Ty Greenwood, who was an analyst yep. over there yep. too. So, and Don't Biff Pogi, by the way, the head coach Biff Pogi, who. I mean, he doesn't look like a guy whose name is Biff. You know, when you think of Back to the Future and you think of Biff, you think of some cat named Biff, you think of, you know, an ascot or yeah, yeah, a, guy yeah, that yeah. Wear, a guy that wears a scarf when it's 68 out, that kind of yeah. crap. Uh, this guy, this guy looks like he's changing oil, man. It's a fantastic yeah. name, best name and best coach's name in college football, in my opinion. He said Carolina <laughs> football is the program in the States. I'm sure he's heard from, heard from NC State fans oh, in the last 24 hours. Him. But yeah. this is a program that's put a lot of money into it, Jacob. Yeah, They're yeah. trying to be relevant, and mm-hmm. I think programs like this are cool. It's a mm-hmm. place for a lot of guys to move down to. Some can move up. And he's got himself some pretty smart, experienced people on that staff. And they they go they have twenty two power conference guys in the one two so mm-hmm. they might not be terrible they they gave Madison a game that thing was was anybody's game well into it and JMU scored a very late touchdown to make it look more lopsided than it really was but mm-hmm. uh, I think that Carolina needs to be ready to play in this one yeah. they don't want to give a team like that confidence because those kids are going to be fired up coming in. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. Caroline needs to take care of business, do what they got to do, and get better. Find the identity and get better. Yeah, no doubt. I got one more for you, too, AJ. Corey Bell. Oh. You guys remember Corey Bell? He's a f- football performance assistant coach for Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's, he's oh, okay. in the mix there, too. Yeah, he's in the mix there. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I didn't, when I did the report yesterday, I didn't note him. So good. A lot of, uh, good fly. that was one good I, I by, uh, <laughs> by Mr. Turner. Hey, man, it, it happens sometimes. But, uh, Usually, I you don't get a helmet more. sticker for that. Yeah, man. You I get a helmet. Well, I, I, I the Cayman more. Rucker said he got seven helmet stickers. I was about to say, you side note too, because it, and it, it 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 clicked for me after thinking about it for five seconds on Thursday. But I remember watching the game, and I'm like, "What are these helmet stickers at, man?" And I'm like, "Oh, okay, they just don't give them out till after a game." I thought maybe they might give some out in practice or something. Not, it's not yeah, that. No, no, it, no, it's no, no, game no, performance no, 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 related. No, 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 okay, game. good to know. Yeah. I, I thought it would it would they would have made those jerseys pop a little bit more, in my opinion. You throw some stickers on the back of those helmets. But man, they so. accrued. Just look at watch the uh, watch Ohio State's helmet change throughout the course of the year. <laughs> you want that? Yeah, the helmet stickers are great. Uh, Cayman said he had seven. I said, "You go fill that helmet up." He goes, "I'm trying to." <laughs> that little sly rucker look i'm trying to yeah, out of the he, corner of his eye he's a fantastic helmet sticker, yeah. helmet, uh, i think omarion got the most which is omarion's gonna need to have like he's gonna have helmet stickers on his face mask by yeah the season ends. yeah i think you're absolutely right about that man i think in the more helmet stickers you see i guess the better for everybody involved because i know they'll stop <laughs> stop giving them things out if, if people aren't performing well but but yeah a lot of unc connections a, a game that carolina should definitely win and a game that again i think just to sum it up, because we're not going to sit here and, and talk about Charlotte. You know, I can't. There's not a lot to talk about. Too. I know you mentioned you know 22 guys coming from you know you know Power Five programs. That's a positive for them, and it, it makes Carolina's test a little bit more difficult. But again, it's a program that just played one game, like North Carolina. A lot of new faces on that team, and it's in a program that's still trying to kind of find its way at the level it's at and, and, and build on it. So definitely a game that Carolina should win. But 
I think from a Carolina perspective, just to sum it up, I think in terms of uh, let's do this, because I know we typically do this for every opponent. This is a little bit different because of the matchup and it's a game that Carolina should win. But let's talk about what Carolina needs to do in this game. And for me on offense, it's just about establishing more of an identity, particularly through the passing game. Can we start to see some stuff? Can we start to see more of these playmakers that Carolina has at, at the wide receiver position, at the tight end position? Can we start to see them get more involved? And can we start to see Connor Harrell, you know, just grow into that position as a leader a little bit more? I said it in the drop, I, excuse me, in the podcast I did. Um, about Max Johnson getting hurt of, you know, pressure, pressure makes diamonds. The old saying goes, maybe the fact that he knows he's the number one guy now, maybe the fact that he knows, you know, the pressure's on him to deliver that can, it, that can make people's performances go up be a little bit more secure in yourself saying, not looking over your shoulder every second. Like, well, I might get an opportunity if Max doesn't play well. And if I don't play well, I might, you know, I'm probably going to get ripped back out and not play again. It's his position now and it's his offense now. Maybe he takes it and runs with it and he kind of grows into that position. That's what Carolina is going to be hoping for. So that's what I'm looking for on offense. And again, on defense, AJ, just keep building on it. Keep building on that first performance, especially on the line. I want to see pressure up front. You know, I think it was five sacks, seven tackles for loss against Minnesota. That's a positive. I was very impressed with that build on it though you can't just do it one game and then skip a couple and then maybe do it again some other time you have to continue to build on those performances and i want to see the defensive line especially going up against a charlotte team that carolina is going to have is going to have a size advantage on and should in the trenches i want to see carolina defensive line continue to improve on that because if carolina's defensive line continues to play like it did against minnesota the whole group is going to continue to prove and look better so uh, those are more big picture things that i'm looking for because i'm not going to divide it into individual position group battles and you know carolina needs to stop the run here and do this against the past yeah. i don't think this okay. game necessarily comes down to that but that's what i'm going to be looking at so what are you looking at in terms of this game on, on saturday i agree with every word you said defensively uh mm -hmm. i I'll, what i will add to it is depending on how many snaps charlotte runs minnesota only ran 55 minnesota wanted to drain some clock uh, if they if the defense is on the field for 65 70 snaps i want to see what the snap distribution is mm -hmm. If the game doesn't get out of line or before it gets out, if Carolina's are building a big lead, then that's going to skew the, the snap distribution. I want to see at what point, what series do they put second team guys in at certain positions. So otherwise, I agree with you 100% defensively. Offensively, I'm going to warn Carolina fans, if you come out of this game and Connor doesn't chuck it down the field too much and there aren't a lot of big explosives from Connor, don't be upset or be concerned this is a process remember the p word mm -hmm. basketball we used to always use it so much and we still do this is a process for connor and it's got kind of a, a pretty much ready offense around him and i say ready because the offensive line did play pretty well last week and i, I think they're going to be okay at at least connor kind of has to catch up to a lot of other stuff and chip we're going to find out what chip thinks of connor right now a little bit but also what does he run every once in a while not most downs but what does he kind of run every once in a while where he's trying to feel out connor in certain areas that's going to be fun that's going to be fun to watch so to me the game so much of the game is about total yards, final score, all these different guys that are potential three-star candidates after the game. But in the end, what do they think of Connor? How do they use him? And if can we see their confidence in him change and grow during the course of the game because they start adding more, more looks to – more calls to his uh, to what he's doing on offense. If they're very vanilla the whole time, maybe they're just going for the reps, the confidence, the reps, get a win, get out of there. If they're vanilla and then they start to add a few wrinkles, that's a great sign. That shows you that they're sort of slowly unleashing there. They are in a learning and fact finding mission as well. So that would that to me is what makes this such an interesting game. Carolina's going to win the game. They're going to find ways to win, even if they just hand it off to Amarian and Darwin and Davion and those guys, and they just run straight ahead. They'll still win the game mm -hmm. unless they totally screw up. And Connor could be part of that screw up because of the interception problem. Uh, he, had, he threw two last year, and he threw some during fall camp. So if he doesn't do that, 
it gives us a chance to just kind of watch him grow before our eyes. And I think that's pretty fun. It's been a while for Carolina since Carolina fans have had a relative unknown. Sam was an unknown before his first game. He was not an unknown by the time he hit that fade to Daz uh, Newsom yeah. in the end zone against Miami a week later. So how long does it take for Connor to no longer be an unknown? That process begins Saturday at 3.30. Yeah, no, absolutely, it does. I, I, side note, real quick, I got to ask you something because I, I know you've, pro- I know you've seen these and and, and heard about these, but <laughs> the experiment. This is going into the Keenan Stadium experience because me, you know, me and AJ have always been people who've been, I'd say, relatively critical of maybe about the game day experience and times and how it can be improved. We've offered some constructive criticism, AJ. Let's not let's not uh, dance around that. Have you seen the experimental suites that they're doing in, in Section One Thirty One? Have you, have you got a chance to? Have you seen anything about those? Have you got a chance to? To see some of the you know pictures that have been going around on social media i, I was just curious to what your thoughts are on them um because i know a lot of carolina fans maybe not you know too excited about them but i i do think it's an interesting one because i've never really seen anything like that maybe you have you've been covering for college football a long time a lot longer than i have but i saw bubba cunningham in the press box in minnesota a couple times and he was immersed in conversations with other people so i avoided going up to him and i was going to go up to him for the specific purpose of asking what in the hell is going on in the stands (laughs) what is that crap so i didn't and the other thing is um a couple of us said Thursday night in Minnesota, we got to ask Mac about those, those sweets, uh, <laughs> but we didn't ask him because as one person said, he's just going to say, well, you got to ask Bubba about that. Mm. You know, the guy that, that knows every cut of paint that's put on the building suddenly doesn't know what's in the <laughs> stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. way, I'm, I'm having fun here with this. No, I know you, I know you, I know you. Uh, honestly, I thought it was a joke and I reached out to the program uh, Barstool was just oh yeah obliterating Carolina. I reached out to the program, and a spokesman from the program said via text, uh, "Bar, uh, I'm paraphrasing, Barstool is really kicking our blank right now." Yeah. Uh, first thing I do when I get in the stadium is I'm gonna look over to see if it's real. Yeah, is it like a? Is this? Even I mean, the real? football account retweeted and stuff. It, you can't possibly tell me somebody with an education passed on that. And they're expensive too. I forgot what the price was, but well, who cheap. in their right mind? Who in their right mind is going to pay that money? They're not air conditioned. No, they're not shaded from the sun. Really, there's a TV. I, I just, <laughs> I honestly a lot of can't see. But if it's bright out, you're not going to be able to see the screen. Got a jumbotron up there too. I mean, if you need to see a replay, you can see it. It's too huge. I, I just. Need it. If you wanted to do, it's like if you were to have asked an NC State person to infiltrate North Carolina football and do something to really embarrass the program and give people more reason to continue a narrative about UNC football, they would have come up with this. (laughs) Yeah, man. Again, I... I get why they put it where they put it because those I are know, because it's, but but, but it's those are full. a lot of people around there. But it, you you've but seen those it are full. Games. The home side's always full. That's a good point. I thought they would put it on the away side. My my dad no, has season it. tickets in that if, other corner near the blue zone, and that's an empty area. A lot not near the blue zone, near the Keenan Football Center. That is a very empty yeah, area, and that's because the students sometimes don't show up. But look, yeah. this this stadium was sixty three thousand seats six years ago. Yeah. And and for for really good conference games, they would draw fifty eight thousand and above. Okay, well, fifty six. You know, in the butch, you go back and look at the butch attendances. They were fifty eight, fifty nine, sixty, sixty one, sixty two, that kind of thing. Now it's fifty thousand five hundred. That's not enough. I mean, you, you still have too many. Rather, mm-hmm. I, I think it's a really bad idea. Why not finally build? Tear down the press box, build a new press box, build luxury suites. About that. As, some, as a Carolina a person I spoke with the other night said, you know what? Why not just redo the Pope box, redo the press box, put a ton of luxury seats up there and some spe- the blue zone style seating should go there on both yeah. sides. Yeah. And then turn the blue zone into a 21 and older, almost like a bar. Turn it yeah, into 21 and older, uh, <laughs> sell the tickets for cheap, and mm-hmm. don't let people in the blue zone while the game is going on uh, to sit at the bar. They have to be in the stands, and they have people come serve them drinks in the stands. That's what they should do. I like that. Uh, but 
they're going to do this. I just, I just think it's interesting. I'm going to look this. I swear to you, I'm not kidding. <laughs> the first thing I do when I get into the press box, I'm going to look over there to see if those things are actually there. See if it's real. Yeah. Cause I feel, cause I still believe I'm getting played. Like I'm the only guy who knows about this. And it's this weird dream I'm having that I can't yeah, get out real. of. And I'm going to wake up and they, and, and they didn't do something this stupid. This embarrassing. And it's, this, this is the last thing I'll say about it because we talk about this all day. But the seats behind it in 131, like, you're not going to be able to see anything. Those are good seats. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're under the cover, too. I know there's not a lot over there, but those are good seats, man. Like, I'm assuming people are going to be sitting there, or did they just cancel those tickets? I don't know. I just find it very interesting. And does it, and I'm not saying I don't know what Carolina's tickets have done this year, but like, you are ch- taken out, you know at least over i would say i don't know how many total to build these but i would say at least 100 seats i mean were those not sold that. like what is what more is, than you know, that what is can that you mean? imagine can you imagine i've been to a ton of football stadiums in my life yeah yeah and can you imagine rolling into a stadium for the first time like man this place is beautiful among the pines all this is historical it's one of the beautiful beautiful pictures stadium in the country. what the hell is that <laughs> you know that's that's like a giant pimple on a model's face and, and, and it's a great way to put it and i'll say this too is i don't know if you've seen what duke's done in their end zone the, the end zone because in duke's had a small state and they never, it's never really sold out or filled up but they did like a whole like tailgate party area in the end zone and i like that i like that idea yeah. for a duke but it's not just like these two like you know, 10 by 10 squares on the metal poles. It's actually like a whole, like kind of built concourse, concourse. area. Yeah. That looks this pretty good. Cool. Yeah. But this yeah. one's kind of like, I it's a great idea for Duke. It's, yeah. and, and people have tried to draw the comparison. Like there is no comparison. No, no, never, never seen anything. There's no like comparison. It. It's an interesting one, man. There's no comparison. There, it, it is mind boggling. So we'll see. And I'm going to take a picture of it and tweet it out. There is and a fan probably, in there, and I'll, I'll probably write SMH, huh? And there, there is a fan in there too, AJ. I don't. Again, these are loud. They're incredibly priced out. High it is to get in these. I know you have to have a certain amount of people to do it, but the fan is. First of all, much. at least you got a fan. What fan? What fan is going to want to sit there and have people look up and say, "Ah, you're the chump that paid for this." Yeah, I, I, I don't get it, man. Especially for the price. I mean, I, I, I don't think I'd want to sit there. If you have enough money to pay for those, you got enough money to sit indoors and watch the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. You buy a luxury suite. Yeah, I, I, and it came out of nowhere too. That's why I asked. It's crazy. You it. It was so I remember crazy. when NC State built Vaughn Towers because I was covering State a lot back then, and Vaughn Towers is still great. They got 46 luxury suites. Yeah, it's I big, believe is what it is. Big, yeah. And I'm thinking, well, okay, it's a matter of time for Carolina. Here we are 20 years later, and Carolina still doesn't have luxury suites. And now they're doing this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've heard they're just, uh, like, testing them out is what I've heard, too. So do they get taken no away test. after two games? Like, a game? Like, no, this is not going to work. Like, uh, I don't know. I would assume not if people have bought them, which I'm assuming people If have. they're smart – they give the money back to anybody who bought them. <laughs> All right. And people show up. And instead of those things there, there's just a big tarp that says psych. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like we screwed around with you guys. And this isn't real. We're just messing around. We, we weren't serious about this. Yeah. There's I, some people that probably like the idea that are th- that are just fuming at us right now, but uh, it's a terrible idea. There is a one person I talked to that just didn't bust out laughing. Yeah. And what it, it did is it really it really fed the narrative about Carolina football. I know it was, was kind of like they were playing into it, like, "Oh, don't do that, you guys. You got you got to know better than that." And like, it's come like on, walking God. over to NC State and that giant wolf's den and just throwing a ton of red meat right at him. Yeah, it's just like God, man. How about yeah. it, boys? I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. But AJ, real quick, I, we, we were done talking about that. We'll see how it looks on Saturday. I know it's not going to look good. We'll see how it looks. Just to end this real quickly. On a more serious note, I want to give a, a shout out and just to tell everybody on here. I know AJ put it on Twitter and, and on social media yesterday. Just thoughts and prayers with our very own Kevin Roy, um, photographer here, diagnosed with with cancer and is immediately going to start chemotherapy. I know it, it, big of a rock star he is. He's still going to be out there shooting games. Um, describe, you know, he describes doing that as kind of his happy place. So I just wanted to give a shout out. I know we were just joking around. This is more of a serious note, but thoughts and prayers with Kevin right now. And if you guys are in, you know, are people who pray and, and do believe in that kind of stuff, you know, definitely 
keep Kevin in, in your prayers there because it's a tough, tough break for him. But, you know, no doubt as, as tough as he is, he's going to be able to get through it. But just wanted to throw that in there as well. Can't can't hop off this podcast without not saying something about that. So, yeah, I've known about this coming for a while because he, he's been keeping me up to date about it. And we wanted to wait to do something public when it was fully confirmed mm-hmm. and when there was a plan of attack. So he's going to undergo chemo. He's going to have a pretty invasive, uh, intense chemo. So there are going to be some games he can't shoot mm-hmm. and that's okay. Uh, but I want him to do as much as he can for himself because as he said, it's his happy place and he wants to feel normal and just sort of have a few hours where he's not thinking about it. So um, prayers to him, obviously. And I've asked for prayer warriors all over to, to, to jump on board and, and not just for Kevin, but for his family yeah, as cool. someone who has dealt with a loved one who's gone through a lot of health problems. My wife almost died two years ago. In fact, the doctor brought my daughter and me in to say goodbye. That's how close it was. Mm -hmm. And she's been dealing with constant complications of a variety of things stemming from that since then. Uh, You say prayers for the others, too, for his wife and and his daughters, because it affects them tremendously. And sometimes we only say prayers for the person who's sick, but Mm -hmm. say prayers for the others, too, because they need it as well, because they need to be there for the sick person. His wife needs to be there for Kevin. So give her strength, too. Yeah, no doubt absolutely. about it. And, and, I will, and I'm sure that I can speak for Kevin on this one. Kevin, uh, not a fan of the those little special seats in the stands. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah he yeah. would be far more eloquent about it than me. No, than no, no, no. Yeah. No, no. And I, 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 I need bombs, to get- S bombs, <laughs> all kinds of bombs. I'm excited. Vintage, to see now. vintage I'm Kevin Roy. I'm excited to see these sweets now, man. I'm actually looking forward to it. I want to lay my, it's like seeing Bigfoot. Like I want to see it to believe nope. it. I don't know if it's real or not. I think you might, it could be an optical. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. Big might foot, be trolling uh, us, AJ. I think maybe they're just like, yeah, we're going to put these sweets out real quick. Yeah, 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 we're going to do that. And Elvis at a roadside, Elvis at a roadside bar in Chile. <laughs> you know, uh, Hitler, Hitler's, Hitler's in a bungalow in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this is one of them. This is the other conspiracy that's popped out. The lot. Yeah, there's one that's been up lately that JFK Jr. is actually still alive. He stages it. Yeah, there. I've seen that. And he's one. got a big beard, like the beard that Tom Hanks had when he was jogging in Forrest Gump. Yeah, <laughs> he's kind of got that thing going on. This JFK Jr. Right JFK Jr. is at every Trump rally. That kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it's gonna be an unsolved mystery show. And then, there, and then there's movie. whatever the hell we're gonna call it. <laughs> You know, we, we used to call sweets. the stands, people used to call the stands at Keenan the Aluminum Jungle. They called the old, before the Vaughn Towers, they called the old press box at NC State the double wide in the sky. Oh, that's fantastic. What that's are we going to call this thing? That's what I want. I want names. Let us know, guys. Let us Tell know. us what you think. The mm-hmm. best one and the best, do them publicly on Twitter. Yep. Tag us. And the one that generates the, and let's vote, the one that generates the most feedback, I'm giving that person a one year subscription. I love that. I love that. This is going to be fun. Let's come up with a name for that atrocity in the stands. Link in the description below at Halo Illustrated. Go over there. Just, just, all you have to do is say a name. We, we will know what it X, is. X, Twitter, whatever you want. I still call it Twitter. It's Twitter. It'll never be X to me, at least. It's Twitter. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm stubborn. Exactly. <laughs> I'm surprised I don't still use a rotary phone. Yeah. Um, I'm old guy. So <laughs> tell us what it is. Publicly, don't DM on, uh, don't DM us, and let's see what generates the most feedback. Let's do a, an, an informal public vote on that, and whoever co- get whoever's name generates the best response and gets the most votes, you get a one year subscription to THI. I like that, man. That's easy. That's easy right there. Just get, get creative with it, guys. And the funniest one will win. I'm looking forward to looking at those. And again, it's it links in the description to our Twitter. Just just <laughs> reply with the name. You know, if there's anything else, we'll we'll know exactly what you're talking about. But yeah, man, it's it's an interesting one. And I, I'll give credit too because I did see some stuff that Carolina's done before game before the game with some of the changes they've made and some of the more like you know uh, events they have going on around the bell tower. And, and kind of in the, in the I haven't run up on any of that yet. Yeah, I there's been some changes. It. It's a little bit different. There's, you know, a little bit more like events going on in and around the st- around the stadium before the game. That I, I think it's the best I've seen in a while in terms of like what they've changed. You know, they tried to have those like concerts out in front of the stadium, and they didn't really work. And some of the other tailgate thing you can buy didn't really work. But I'm not going to go into detail with it. I'll give them some credit for that because I do like some of the pregame changes I've seen at least with some of the festivities. And again, I mean, it, it always helps to 
you know, find other ways to, to entertain people because get there early. I mean, that's one thing. If you're a fan, it's always good as get there as early as you can. I think some of this will, will help out, but those sweets, man, huh? I don't know too much about that. I'll believe them when I see it. I, again, I'm like you, AJ. I don't know if they're even real yet. I think it, this could just be a big, you know, conspiracy theory, optical illusion fake out that we're seeing right now. But we'll see on Saturday around, uh, you know, I guess you'll be there around 1.30. And you know, I'll be around there around the same time. So we'll see. AJ, make sure you post a picture on Twitter when you see those things too, man. Oh, you know, I will. And, and <laughs> my, uh, S-M-H. You're sitting there. SMH. <laughs> SMH. Can I cover a game in there? It'd be a nice place to sit. It might be a good vantage point. Get a little fan going in there, a little open air press box kind of vibe. That could be a, a decent place to sit. Maybe I mean, if they bring me out, bring me some food along the way too. That's another thing too. They bring you food in there. They bring you alcohol. Like, or do you have to go get it still? Is that, that's my another question I have. I feel like it has to be included. If right? you have to go get the, well, you got to use the restroom. So you got to climb down those little steps. Oh, God, yeah, how do you get up there? Yeah, yeah. I didn't so gonna, think about some that. big, some big hot shot spending cash is going to slip and fall and blow his knee out <laughs> after six drinks going to go to the, you know what, in the uh, third quarter. Most photographed thing during that game from fans isn't going to have anything to do with the game. It's going to probably be those suites and the people standing in it. So absolutely. If you're listening, you're in one of those stands suites too. Go ahead and reach out to us on Twitter. I need a little more information on those. I and mean, maybe who knows? Maybe that makes about more. as much sense as me writing my game story. Like they used to write the newspapers and the Flintstones when they would hammer that thing. Yeah. Against- <laughs> That's how I'm going to write my game story now. That makes the same amount of sense. Oh, God, it's an it's un, uh, unreal move. But again, maybe, hey, who knows, man? Maybe it'll look better in person. You never know, man. Some things look better in person. I'm not uh, banging on it. No, 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 <laughs> Actually, no, I'm no, trying to no, give him a little no, bit of it now here. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, right. I've already, some, sometimes I'm stubborn. More than sometimes my wife, my wife will tell you, yeah, I'm, I'm stubborn on this one. My mind's not changing. Yeah, you yeah, know it's yeah. going to be even worse in public because public will confirm its reality. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right now, it's it's kind of still a, it may not be real. So yeah, you're right. It'll be worse when we actually confirm they are real. But reach out to us, guys. We kind of named you for when we want to hear from funniest one again. Gets that one year subscription to THI, which is a pretty good value, eight thirty three a month. And if you want to sign up, go ahead and do that as well. All right, AJ, just get out of here. We can talk about these sweets for another seventeen hours, but I think we need to stop railing on them. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Another edition of the UNC Football Show. Appreciate you guys watching as always um make sure you like the video share it hit the notification bell too um and yeah if you think carolina's let's do this too if you think carolina's gonna win on saturday and if you like a lot of the things you saw against minnesota go ahead and like the video below let's see how many we can get on this one we appreciate you guys watching as always and we'll see y'all next time thanks thanks